And chapter 2 is going to start off with him crying out to the Lord. And we're going to start with verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish belly, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell I cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So he's in the belly of the whale. Do you think that inside of the belly of a whale stinks? Inside a fish? I would say it stinks. Well, that's exactly what it's like when we're out of God's will. It stinks. It's a terrible smell when we're not walking with the Lord. We find Johnny here, he's begging to the Lord here for the trouble he got himself into. So many times we've done that ourselves, gotten ourselves into trouble. The Lord didn't get us in trouble, we got ourselves into trouble. Then we have to end up crying out to the Lord, Oh Lord, help me. Jonah died here and went to Sheol. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 12, that Jonah was a type of Christ. We're going to read that. Jonah, we're going to find that Jonah is a type of Christ. Because in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 through 41, it says, But Jesus replied, Only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. People look for signs. And the Lord says right here, there's only one sign I'm going to give you. And that's the sign of Jonah. Pentecostals, unless you speak in tongues, they say you're not saved. They need a sign to show that you're born again. And they say, if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not born again. They need a sign. Verse 39 says, only an evil and an adulterous generation looks for a sign. You can't just tell a Pentecostal, I'm born again, I'm saved. Because the first thing you're going to say to you, have you spoken tongues? That's a sign to them that you got born again. We don't need that. It's not in the Bible. I've taught on it. I've taught, I've given the scriptures that they use, that they say that you have to speak in tongues to be saved. Well, that's wrong. Look at all the signs Jesus did while he was here on earth. He fed the 5,000. He was healing everyone. How many of those people got saved? Those thousands of people at the cross, how many of them were hollering crucify him? He gave them all the signs they needed. Took a few fish and fed thousands of people. He was healing everybody. He was giving them all the signs they needed. But did they believe? No, they didn't. The Lord wants you to have faith from your heart. He wants you to believe, he wants you to believe from your heart that He is there, that He is God, that He is for real. He doesn't want you to seek after a sign because then what are you believing in? In Jesus, God, or are you believing in that sign? Think about it. He said there were no signs except the sign of Jonah. Like I said, Jonah was a type of Christ. And then in verse 40, For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now in those three days, Jesus went to preach to the lost people, the ones who had died, who were lost, and they're in a place called Sheol. He went down there in 1 Peter 3.19, it says, by which also he went, and now this is after his crucifixion, Jesus, it says, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So on one side of Sheol was called prison, and the other side of Sheol, which is a river, the other side was called paradise. Just like he told the, the, the thief on the cross that, that accepted him on the cross, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, that's what he was talking about. I'm going to go to paradise and prison, because the only thing that split it to was a river. And he says, I'm going to go down there and preach to the ones in prison. And you might say, well, how is he going to preach to, preach to dead people? I mean, if they're dead. Well, in Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 24, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Adam's bosom, which is another way of saying hell or Sheol. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being tormented, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And he sent and sent Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So on prison side, they were already being tormented by the heat. 
And the, this rich man was, was hollering out to, to Abraham, send Lazarus over here, just so he can put his finger in the water and touch my tongue, because he was being tormented with the heat. But they're, no, they're not dead. When you die, you're not dead. When you die, you continue living, but you're not living on this earth anymore. We're all going to live forever. It's either going to be in hell or it's going to be in heaven. And God said, you know what? I'm going to leave that choice up to you. I'm not going to make you go to heaven. I'm not going to make you go to hell. I'm leaving that choice up to you. While you're here on earth, you make the decision where you want to go. Amen. Amen. And then Jesus was re resurrected and went to heaven. Well, Jonah went to the heart of the well, and he was alive just like Jesus, but he was resurrected. Jesus was resurrected. Jonah was not. He was just, and I believe Jonah was dead, just like this. it says it right here in Matthews, that he's a type of Jesus. Jesus went to hell. Well, in the belly of the fish, that's where Jonah was. And whether he was alive or dead, the Lord brought him back to life. If he was alive in the well, well, the Lord brought him back to earth. Let me say it this way. Yeah. He's, is, we'll see that the whales spit Jonah out. But either way, Jonah did not get his resurrected body. He was like Lazarus. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus didn't get his resurrection body. He just, he just raised him from the dead because Lazarus, he did up in and dying again. Now in verse 41, it says, The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation of judgment on Judgment Day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Now we're going to find in chapter 3 that Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, they, they, do, re, they do repent and they turn to the Lord. And right here he's saying, right here, he says, Nineveh will stand up against this generation, talking about the generation of Jesus, will stand up against this generation, those people, on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of John, because they repented, just like us. I've told you on, on the teaching on the last days, how we're going to come with Jesus. Okay, we're not doing the judging, but we'll be with him when he does, when he does judge. So we'll be with him, but it won't be us doing the judging. We'll just be there. We're going to be there with him. That's what the Bible says. So on Judgment Day, the people in Nineveh will be there on judgment on the generation of Jesus. And the thing, but it says, Jesus is saying, a greater than Jonah is here. Now we're going to find that later on, we're going to find that Jonah, when he did go to Nineveh, the people, the city repented. Now, I'm not going to get too much into that because I'm, go I'm going to get there. But we're going to see what he means by greater than Jonah was here. Now back to, to uh, Jonah, verse 3. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compass me about. All thy pillows and thy waves pass me over. Then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward the holy temple. Now, who cast Jonah into the seas? Wasn't the sailors? God is the one who cast Jonah in. He used the sailors just by physically casting them over. But what did Jonah tell the sailors? If y'all want to be saved, you got to throw me overboard. Yeah. This was God who did it. And we can see the Lord can use lost people. These guys were lost at the time, they were lost. And God used them to do His will. So God does use lost people, not because they're Christians. Remember, they're lost. But he can use lost people to, to either uh, do something like this or whatever it may be. He can do it. Jonah says, I'm cast out of thy sight. Remember, Jonah's the type of Jesus. What did Jesus say on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So just like Jonah says, I'm cast out of thy sight, Jesus was cast out of the sight of God. Only because, not because he had sin, but he took on the sins of the world. And when he took on the sins of the world, God couldn't look at him, couldn't look down on him anymore. So that's what this is talking about. Jonah didn't lose his salvation because he says, I looked again toward the holy temple. He knew that he would see the Lord again. Just like when Jesus told his disciples that he would come back. 
This is what Jonah is saying. He knew the Lord was going to send him back. Verse 5. The waters compassed, compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me around about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Now what was wrapped around Jesus' head? Thorns. They wrapped thorns around you. Like I said, Jesus said that Jonah was like him, was a type of Christ. And everything I'm reading right here is just almost the same thing Jesus went through. In verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bores was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Jonah's speaking about how bad it is to be separated from the Lord. That's what he's saying right here. How bad it is to be separated from him. And did the Lord leave him? No, the Lord didn't leave him there. Jonah, Jonah got very personal with, the, with, with God because he says, Oh my God. When we say my God, we're making it personal with our Lord. You know, I don't know if y'all, when y'all pray, if y'all, I don't know if y'all make the statement, my God. When you say my God, I mean, you're saying my God, like it's you and him. And this is what Jonah was doing. He made it very personal. He was like, my God, even though he's everybody else's God that's believes in him. But Jonah made it very personal when he said, my God. And when I'm really needing him, that's pretty much what I say. I'll say, my God, because I need that personal relation. I need to know he's there personally for me. In verse 7, when my soul fainteth within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came unto thee into thy holy temple. As Jonah saw, he was falling deeper and deeper from the Lord. That's what he's saying right here. He knew that he needed to come to him again. He needed to come to the Lord. I'll give just a real quick little testimony on myself. I backslid from the Lord, and I saw I was just getting deeper and deeper, and I didn't like it. And I called out to the Lord. I called out to the Lord one night, and he, he told me, he said, Jesse, I haven't left you. You're the one who's left me. And as soon as I heard that from the Lord, I repented and got back walking with the Lord again. Amen. But I know what Jonah was feeling right here. The Lord didn't leave him. We, the Lord, when you're born again, the Lord will not leave you. That's, that's a promise we need to hold on to. No matter how much, look how much trouble Jonah got into. God had to put him in the belly of a whale, but God did not leave him. He had to chastise him, and that's some pretty serious chastising. And just like with us, sometimes the Lord has to chastise us, but when he's chastising us, he doesn't leave us. He's right there with us. And in verse 8, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Now, lying vanities, lying van vanities mean like Jonah here. You know, he, he thought he could run from the Lord. You're thinking you can run for the Lord, not be in God's will, but still please Him. That's lying. But you're lying to yourself. You think you can do this over here, even though it's not Christian, but you think you can do this and still please the Lord this, oh, by going to church or whatever it may be. You're living two kind of lives. You're sneaking this over here, but yet you're saying, oh, I love the Lord. That's just lying vanities. You understand what I'm saying? That's what lying vanities are. And when you do that, when you're living like a double life, you're a Christian over here, but then you say, oh, this is just a little sin, you know, it's not bad. No, you're just lying to yourself. Because sin is sin, right? There's no little sin. There's no such thing as a little sin. In God's eyes, sin is sin. And what you're doing, what you're doing, you're just separating yourself from the Lord. That's what you're doing. Now the question, what... What well has the Lord had to use to get our attention? I know the wells lose, I know the Lord has had used a well to get our attention. I know He's done with me, and I don't think I'm the only wicked one here. <laughs> so I know the Lord, He has to use something big to get your attention. Because sometimes we walk away, we walk away, and before you know it, we're separated. And he wants you back. Just like we're going to see here in Jonah, he wants you back. So he's going to do what he can do. He's going to do what he can to get you back. So right now we have to ask ourselves, well, just to yourselves, you know, what will has the Lord had to put me in 
for me to open my eyes. On some of us, it's either a well or something big, something big. The Lord has to kind of use a hammer to hit our head. It's kind of like that. Hey, hello. We're one. Remember me? I'm your Lord. Because sometimes we, we slide away. Sometimes we, we get our eyes off the Lord. And sometimes he's got to knock us in the head and say, hey, I hope you all understand what I'm saying. Wouldn't it be just better if we just obeyed God all the time? Wouldn't it be better? He wouldn't have to send a well into our life. Yeah. Verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So what Jonah is saying here is, I'm going to sing songs of praise. Jonah is still in the well. He's repenting right here. He's still in the well. In the stomach of the well. But what's he doing? He's repenting and he's singing songs to the Lord. So when we're in that stinky place where we're separated from God, we still need to pray. We need to repent. And even if we're still, okay, just say, okay, I did something bad and I was put in prison. I backslid and I did something bad and bad enough to put me in jail. Okay, I'm in jail. But when I realize what I've done, I repent, Lord, forgive me. Then I start singing songs to him. I start praising him. Even though I'm still in jail, I'm still going to, I'm going to start praising him. Because who put me there? For what? For disobedience. So it was my fault that I am where I'm at. For disobeying God. So when I realize that, I'm like, I'm go I know this is what I deserve, Lord. But I'm going to praise you. Whether you get me out of prison or not, I'm still going to praise you. And this is what Jonah was doing here. He repents. And he starts praising the Lord. He's repenting from not going to Nineveh. The Lord said go to Nineveh. Preach to him. And that's what he's re re repenting about. He says salvation is of the Lord. That, that statement means so much. We mess up. We mess up. And God is there to make it right. When we want him to. When we're ready. When we're ready and we realize. We've, we've sinned. We're away from God. When we're ready. He's there. Salvation is of the Lord. He will fix what we mess up. And we mess up a lot. But this is why we're at Bible study. This is why we're reading the Word of God. So that mess up will get less and less. We'll never be perfect while we're here. But we can make our mistakes less and less while we're here. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We can get close to the Lord. And we're still going to have sin. We're not going to be sinless. We'll still have sin, but that sin will be less and less as we grow. Now, verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah onto dry land. It vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now, what well, what well do you know that can go right up to the land and spit you out on land? That's a miracle from God. Seriously. <laughs> What well can, can come that close to shore, and when you come out of the mouth, you're on dry land? That's a miracle right there. Amen. The Lord can do miracles. This is a miracle. This is the Lord. The seas, we know the seas listen to Him. Like in chapter 1, verse 15, it said the fish listen to Him. In Matthew's, I think it's Matthew's, the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree, the fig tree listen to Him. Everything listens to the Lord. Everything. Animals listen to the Lord. Now, do we think we're smarter than animals? We're supposed to be, right? Yeah. We should be smarter than animals, right? Well, who do you think got all on Noah's ark? How do you think all those animals made it on the ark? Did Noah have to go out there and, and like a sheepdog, gather them together? No, God called all... How many different animals did they have? Oh, my gosh, a lot. Those animals heard God, and they went on the ark. Animals, the seas, the fish, the fig, all these, all this listens to the Lord. And we proclaim to be smarter than the animals. Are we? Uh, I find that men, people, I think we're the only ones who don't listen to the Lord. Because God speaks to us. He speaks to us. He tells us what's right, what's wrong. He tells us what to do. He's our instructor. But we don't listen. The animals listen. Animals listen to the Lord and obey. 
The seas and the wind listen to the Lord and obey. But man, because we have a brain and we think we're smarter, I'm starting to see that, you know, we're not that smart. Animals seem to be smarter than us because they listen to God and obey. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Are we seeing who the Lord is? Mm -hmm. He could have just done away with Jonah. Jonah refused to obey him. He could have just done away with Jonah, but he stayed on Jonah. He cares enough to chastise us. Like I said, he, he chastises us because he loves us. He wants us to repent and come back to him. It's not like some, like I said, and I have to say Pentecostals, you know, according to Pentecostals, we mess up, we lose our salvation. It's like, okay, God said, okay, you messed up, I don't need, I, you're not mine no more. That's what they believe. They don't believe in eternal security. They believe you can lose your salvation. But right here, this book is shown right here. Jonah totally disobeyed the Lord, but God did not leave him. Amen? Now in chapter 3, Jonah's going to obey. He's going to obey, but it isn't from the heart. We're going to see Jonah's going to obey God, but we're going to see that it's not from his heart. That's what chapter 3 is going to teach us. And it's, i uh, use an illustration, it's like wives. When the Lord says, wives, submit to your husband. Submission, he wants submission. He wants it from the heart. That's when you're submitting. Most wives obey. I use the word obey because obey is when you do what your husband says. And excuse my expression, but we give him that go to hell look. You do it, but you give him them eyes like, you know. That's not submission. That's just obeying. God wants submission. Jonah right here is going to obey God, but he's not, submi he's not submitting. Hope you understand what I'm saying. Submitting is when it comes from the heart. You're doing it because that's what you want to do. We're going to see the difference. Jonah didn't have the right motives when he went to go preach to Nineveh. His motives were wrong. We're going to see the, this preacher, this Christian, who repents and obeys... But God's not satisfied with that. We're going to see in chapter 3. God isn't going to be satisfied with that. He wants, like I said, He wants total submission. He wants you to do things from your heart. From your heart. Okay? We're going to see the difference there. Now chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Amen. Let me explain what, what I just said there. What this verse means. Preach unto it the preaching that I bid. God is saying preach to them what I want you to preach. I'm sorry to say but we, we don't have preachers like that today. Oh, We might have some. But most preachers today, they don't want to offend you. They will not preach what God says to preach. Just like right here, it says, preach unto the preaching that I bid. God is saying, preach what I'm telling you to preach to them. But we got this new age churches where well, we don't want to offend anybody. In fact, we don't even want to talk about hell because that's negative. There's a lot of churches like that today. We need churches of God. We need men of God who are going to preach His word. That are going to preach what God says to preach. This is what we need today. And we're lacking in that. The church has gotten... To where they, like I said, they don't want to offend anybody. Preachers preach what people want to hear. Now, if they're a wolf, they do that because they're doing it for money. A wolf does it for money. They're not doing it because they love you. They're not doing it because it's the ministry God's given them. They're doing it because they're in it for the money. That's what a wolf is. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 28, they wanted to kill Jesus for what he preached. So when a man of God preaches the word, preaches the word, the Bible, in Luke cha uh, chapter 4, it, it says they wanted to throw Jesus over the hill to kill him. Mm -hmm. And he was preaching the word of God. He was preaching the, Christ, the scriptures. But further down in verse 32, I believe it is, he went to another place to preach, and they found his, his preaching to be astonished. Mm -hmm. huh? So there's two ways we can take the word of God. You can either get offended by it and get mad, or you can say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for showing me. So, Christians, you got two ways of taking it. 
me, I thank the Lord that my heart is saying, Lord, show me. Because when I sin, what's the Bible say? When you sin, you sin against God. And I don't want to sin against God. So I need the Lord to teach me what's right and what's wrong. Now verse 3. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceedingly, exceedingly great city of, of three days journey. Now Jonah finally did what the Lord told him to do, like I said. But look at all the time he wasted. Look at all the time he wasted trying to run from the Lord. Spending time in the belly of the well. If we would just listen to the Lord at the beginning, then we could receive blessings. But it's not a blessing when you're in a stinky well, is it? That's not a blessing. But sometimes that's what we do. We go that way, end up in a stinky place, and then hopefully we repent and come back to the Lord and end up doing what the Lord wanted us to do in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? He wasted a lot of time when he could have gotten blessings for just doing what God said. We try it. We try to do things our way first. And then once we see that we're in trouble, then we do it God's way. This is what's happening here. Verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city at day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now Jonah is preaching, Repent, or you'll, go to, you'll be destroyed. You'll die. Now the Lord has told us the same thing in Matthew 18. 28, 19, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Holy Ghost. That's what we're supposed to be teaching. Mm -hmm. God sent John over there to teach them how they needed to repent and turn to the Lord. This same thing is for us today. We got the same command from the Lord. Just like he sent Jonah, he's sending us today, us Christians. I've told you about the ministry we have, the ministry of reconciliation. So we're just like God told Jonah to do this, he's telling us also, go preach to the lost people. In Acts 2.38, this is what you're teaching them. Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. And you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is what we're supposed to be doing. Telling people that they need to repent. They need to give their life to the Lord. So just like Jonah disobeyed, there's probably some of us in here that are doing just like Jonah. We're disobeying. We're not telling people that we should be telling about Jesus. Do you want to end up in a well? Do you want to end up in a stinky place? I'm just saying, if this is you, if I'm not saying y'all are doing this, but if it is you, you know it. If it is you, you need to get out of that stinky place and start doing what God wants you to do. Because guess what? When you're not walking with the Lord, does God hear your prayer? You can't pray for people and help them if you're not walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord is doing His will. And His will for us is to go witness to people. Amen? Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put sackcloths from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Now this is, like, this is the biggest revival in the history of man. This right here. The whole city of Nineveh, which was about over 6,000 people, were saved. And the number is, like I said, it's, we'll find in the last chapter that it talks about 120, but those weren't adults. And I'll teach that later. Those were children. 120,000 children got saved back in, the la in this the last chapter of Jonah here. But if you look it up, now this is not in the Bible, but if you look it up, Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, in the nation of Syria, it was about 600,000 people there at the time. And this whole city got saved. Look what one man can do. What God can do with one man when he's obedient. One man doing God's will got over 600,000 people saved. He's not expecting 600,000 people to get saved from us. He just wants us to go out there. And we're not going to get 600,000 people because the Bible says, broad is the way to hell. So there's going to a lot of people going to reject what you say to them about the Lord. He said narrow is the gate that goes to heaven. So not that many people are going to accept what you tell them. But we need to be out there telling them. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 
41, remember? He said, greater than Jonah is here. Jonah got 600,000 people saved. And Jesus said, greater than Jonah is here. That's pretty great. I mean, what Jonah did was pretty great. Jesus said in Matthews, greater than Jonah is here. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I want to cry. Really seriously. Jesus said, greater than Jonah is here. And like I said, if one man can witness and a whole city gets saved, imagine what we can do. Because why? Because greater than Jonah is here. Which is who? Jesus. And where is Jesus? Inside of us. You see what I'm saying? Greater than Jonah is here. And he's living inside of us. So if Jonah can do what he did, what can we do? we got to quit listening to the devil and let him give us all these excuses why we can't tell somebody about Jesus. Well, I don't know the Bible yet. Well, you don't need to know the Bible. Whatever got you to turn your life to the Lord, whatever happened to you, and you turned your life to the Lord, that's all you need to tell that person. Because if it got you to turn to the Lord, it could get that person to turn to the Lord. You know, the more you learn the scriptures, you know, the better it is because you can say what the Bible says. But if the only thing you know is, hey, I saw a movie, then this is me. I saw a movie about Jesus, and all I knew was I wanted to give my life to him. Now, right after that movie, I could have started witnessing. Because all I had to do was tell people, hey, I saw what Jesus did for me. And I gave my life to him. So if that happened to me, that could happen to somebody else. So when the devil says, oh, you don't know the, the scriptures or stuff like that. Oh, my gosh. He'll give you every excuse you need. You're too embarrassed. You're too shy. Oh, you're too bad. Oh, look what you've been doing. And you're going to go witness to this person? Remember, we're all sinners. So we can't wait till we're perfect to start witnessing. We're the sinners we are. We're forgiven sinners. Because we go to the Lord and we ask for forgiveness when we do sin. Jesus lives inside of us. Greater than Jonah is here. Those are some great words.